Yeah, students have really complained about the app. They say, oh, you know how to use it, Dr. Wong, but we don't. It's like, oh, I don't know. I record lectures and put them on YouTube. You watch it over and over again, see what I do, and see if you can mimic what I do. Um, in, in the end, I think um, just know the material, no matter what method you use, and I think you'll be fine. But let me get some actions. Pass these back. Thank you. The vertebral column is part of the axial skeleton. And so let me highlight what's called the axial skeleton on this app. I want to zoom in. Whenever I click on something, there's a trail of breadcrumbs on the top, and I just go back and I hit axial skeleton. It lights the whole thing up in green. So what you see lit up on the skeleton is the axial skeleton. The vertebral column is the axis of the axial skeleton, which includes Well, of course, the vertebral column, which is today's lecture. <coughs> the skull. The hyoid bone. I'll just say the hyoid. That's pretty much it. I'll say the vertebral column with ribs. The hyoid bone is um, underneath the lower jaw. Let me zoom in on it. Is that bone highlighted underneath the jaw there? That's the hyoid. The reason why it's floating in space is the only system I have turned on in the app is the skeletal system. So this bone does not articulate with any other bone, which is why it's just floating there. It's the only bone that has that distinction. It's the only bone that does not articulate with any other bone. All other bones connect to some other bone. articulate with any other bone. This bone is in your anterior neck and it's part of the larynx, trachea complex. So if I turn on other systems, you can see how that bone is just superior to the larynx. This bone is usually crushed if someone strangles you uh, in strangulation. It, it's a very small bone and uh, there's a lot of muscles that attach to it. If I turn on the muscles, you can see that there, we call them the strap muscles of the neck. There are many neck muscles, strap muscles of the neck that use the hyoid to attach to it. Strap muscles of the neck attach here. And 
I'll put it superior to the larynx in the anterior neck. I don't feel mine and wiggle it back and forth. I always like kind of feel around here. I go, I just kind of go like this. Oh yeah, I can feel it moving. Uh, it's there. It's right underneath your lower jaw. Well, anyways, that's all I'll say about the hyoid. Um, but isolated. We have hyoids on the stand. I will get some out for lab today. Just be able to identify the hyoid bone. Okay, well anyways. Today, most of the time, I'll spend talking about the retrieval call. So I'm going to go back and turn all these other things off and uh, just get this out of there. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to highlight just the, the, the vertebral column. As you can see, the vertebral column is the axis of your body when isolated. That's what it looks like. Uh, so. People commonly refer to as the vertebral column as the spine, and basically, think of it as the skeleton of the back. When you're looking at it, the vertebral column is literally a column of vertebra. Vertebra, people for, um, commonly refer to as your backbone. Um, well, this column of vertebra is arranged into five regions. Going from superior to inferior, the top seven are called the cervical vertebra. So I'll just say seven cervical. And so we kind of number them C1 to C7. Uh, C standing for cervical, capital C. So C1 to C7. Uh, cervix means neck in anatomy. These are the, basically your neck bones. And, uh, well, they're, they're the top seven. Okay. What you can do is you can kind of touch one of the top seven. and then just tap on cervical vertebra and it just highlights all seven for you. Okay, well anyways, um, the middle, the, or the, the next 12 are in the chest region, they're called the thoracic vertebra. So you have 12 thoracic vertebra, capital T. And if you remember the T1, T12. What's special about this region when we get to it is, um, I have to teach you about the ribs. The ribs attached to um, these 12 vertebra. So you have pairs of ribs. Guess how many pairs? 12. If you have 12 vertebra, you have 12 pairs of ribs. A pair of ribs will articulate with a vertebra, um, the thoracic region. Well, getting to the lower back, you have the lumbar region. You have five rather massive lumbar vertebra, abbreviate capital L. So I'll just number them L1 to L5. Now these top three regions, these first 24, um, you know, th there are spaces between the vertebra if I zoom in, it's 
See how there are little gaps between the backbones? I mean, normally they, they will be filled with bigger vertebral discs, and I'll show you those. But um, the way they articulate, and because there's gaps there filled with <coughs> intervertebral discs, these top three regions are movable. trunk. You can flex forward, you know, what they call it trunk flexion. Trunk extension. You can um, rotate the trunk. There's something called lateral flexion. We just would say you bend side to side. I mean, your trunk is movable. You can bend side to side, you can bend forwards, you can bend backwards, you can rotate your trunk. You can exercise your trunk in a way that's beneficial. Um, okay, now if you get to the bottom regions of the trunk, Those bones are fused, and so this curved um, structure, this is called the sacral, and you have five vertebrae in here in the sacral region. Sacral, capital S, S1 to S5, and your, your little tailbone is called the coccyx, and it's right here. Um, usually there's two to four, there's four here. Oxygeal, abbreviated capital C, lowercase o, so not to be, to be confused with the <coughs> cervical region. So I'll call it CO1 to CO4. So these bottom two regions are fused. Uh, the fusion usually occurs, is complete by around age 17, 25, something like that. Uh, in adults, it's fully fused. And so some of the functions of the vertebral column, that's kind of the anatomical arrangement. One of the things is it houses um, and protects the spinal cord and meninges. So if I turn on the nervous system, kind of see nerves come out of there. So what I've done is I have um, just the vertebral column and I have the nerves turned on. So you can see the brain on top with the eyeballs staring at you, kind of freaky. <laughs> That's what it looks like without the skull around it and your pretty faces, right? Just brain and eyeballs. Well, anyways, one of the functions is to protect the meninges and the spinal cord. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just pick a few of the backbones, multi-select, take a few and I'll hide them. And inside, what you can see there, now that's the dura mater that, that covers the, the spinal cord. Wait, wait, that's the spinal cord inside the vertebral column, right? So I'll kind of like zoom in a little bit. You can kind of see how the cord it's in that posterior hole um, in the vertebral column. So this hole, the word for hole in anatomy is foramen. So that's called the vertebral foramen right there. So let me um, write this off.
the vertebral column protects the spinal cord inside the vertebral canal. The vertebral canal is formed by successively stacked vertebral foramen. The vertebral canal is formed by successively stacked vertebral foramen. So what I like about this app, it has the explode function. Uh, whatever I, I just exploded all the vertebrae, so they're, they're kind of separated. So that way I can show you. So angled this way, if I were to point to this hole, what would you call it? A cable foramen. Now imagine all of these being stacked together. What do you call it? Okay, how about this? On your half sheet, you define vertebral canal, vertebral form. Let's do that. Call number one. Define. Vertebral form. Define the tubal canal. You can just copy what I have, but if you don't understand what you copy, what's the point? I'm trying to get you to have your own understanding of it, right? All right, next term. 
So I got it zoomed in here and I have the nerves turned on. Do you see how there's, there's a little spinal nerve exiting this hole on the side? That's called the intervertebral foramen because it's kind of in between two vertebrae. So that's the next term. You should know that spinal nerves exit intervertebral foramen. <coughs> Let's remember that the uh, spinal cord, it has to issue nerves that exit the bony protective case of the vertebral column so you can innervate body parts and glands and everything your body needs for communication. Okay, well, anyway, let's turn that back off. When you look at the vertebral column, this is an anterior view. It looks basically vertical. But when you look at it from the side, well, it's kind of like a, they say a double S, that there are these curvatures of the vertebral column that are normal, and we kind of define them. So we talk about that. So, um, okay, let's call this the normal curvatures of the vertebral column. Normal curvatures. <laughs> okay. Well, if I can kind of exaggerate the curvatures, kind of like. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum coccyx, more or less, right? And um, how we define curvatures, uh, well, for, for, for uh, example, let's say your eyeball is in the front, you're looking from this perspective, from the anterior view. Um, look at this curvature here. Whenever something curves away from you, from the front, if it curves away from you, that's called concave. Because it's at the front, we say this curvature would be, and this one here, this curvature would be concave anterior. However, this curvature, it would only be concave if you're posterior. So pretend there's an eyeball in the back as well. So if you examine this curvature of the cervical spine, that would be concave posterior. However, if you look at the cervical spine from the front and it curves out at you, that's convex anterior. Just so if you ever see those turns, you know what they mean. I usually tend to use these terms, the concave one, whether from the front or from the back. Okay. This convex um, so if you're looking from the front and it curves out, if you look uh, from the back and it curves away, okay. Any more questions on that? Whenever my wife wants me to cook ribs, she says, put the curve side down and beg it. Curve side down, what is that? Is that con what, which, which is the curve side? So I understand this. <laughs> do, you, do you understand? Any more questions? I'm going to move on.
Okay. Well, this is a normal adult. Let's back up and when you're in the womb, a fetus, and it's, you have one curve. There's you in the womb, you know, uh, in the fetal position, right? And it's just one curve. This was the curve that was there first, this kind of curvature. And they call this the, the, the primary curvature is there first. And it's the same regions, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, coccyx. Okay. Um, so because these, this curvature was there first, they call this the primary curvature. Primary curvature. Primary being there, there first. Turns out the thoracic and sacral curvatures remain throughout adulthood, the same convex anterior curvature. So the primary curvatures are of the thoracic region. And notice how thoracic is spelled C-I-C, but it's pronounced S-I-C, thoracic, okay? Sometimes students misspell it and they, and they say thoracic and I mark that wrong. Or sometimes I hear you in lab pronounce it thoracic. Okay, so it's spelled thoracic, pronounced thoracic. I know it's confusing, okay. Well, the other curvature that remains in adulthood that has that concave anterior is the sacrum coccyx thing. So the sacral region, basically. So these are the primary curvatures, thoracic sacral regions, and they're basically concave anterior, right? And then in adulthood, well, the, as you grow up, we say not necessarily in adulthood, how do these other curvatures form? You know, this, this curvature in the, in the neck forms when baby starts to hold head up. Okay. And you call these the secondary curvatures because they form later in life. Secondary curvatures, um, so of the cervical region, the baby holds head up. All right, the, in the thoracic region, I'm sorry, in the lumbar region, that's another secondary curvature. The lumbar curvature, it starts to form as, you know, a toddler begins to walk. Now, for those of you that bought the um, Atlas of Anatomy, I do refer to it a lot when I teach anatomy lectures. And there's a good uh, figure of spinal development on, on page four, for those of you who bought the Atlas. And for those of you who didn't buy it, don't feel left out. I'm sure you can Google that and find adequate pictures of these other curvatures forming uh, later in life. But anyways, the terms are no. Um, primary curvature, secondary curvatures. These are the normal curvatures of the adult spine. Okay, any questions? Because there are some abnormal curvatures that we commonly see that are medical conditions that we like you to know for the basic anatomy class.
One that um, is an excessive curvature of the thoracic spine, let's say it curves out a little too much, like a hunchback. That's called a thoracic kyphosis. Commonly called hunchback. Usually, you, you might see this in a postmenopausal woman. Maybe they have a, a wedge fracture in that region. Maybe you lose some height and you hunch, hunch over a little bit. <clears throat> excessive, basically, it's an excessive curvature of the thoracic spine, right? You have drawn it there. You can also get an excessive curvature of the lumbar spine. It curves too much that way. That's called a, a lumbar lordosis or swayback. I'm not sure what your question is. Um, I guess I'm trying to figure if I should remember like the thoracic region as part of the the concave posterior, or is that just remembering the curves? Uh, I think I kind of answered this question a little bit. Okay. Sorry. I You're responsible for the normal curvatures and the abnormal ones. Okay. And if it's normal curvature. Like, for example, if I say uh, concave posterior, that describes what? The cervical region and the lumbar region. See if this works. Hold on a second. Let me turn up the volume. Lordosis is an excess inward curvature of the spine, giving a sway back appearance. <coughs> Lordosis can affect persons of any age. Certain conditions can contribute to this condition, including obesity and osteoporosis. So I wanted to show you one of the features for those of you who use the app. What I did was I just clicked on something. Uh, and basically, this scroll thing on the top there had parts, had surfaces, and all these different things. And one was conditions. And there's all these conditions that were listed. And I referred to the one I talked about, the lumbar lordosis. 
Okay, so I want to know that that feature is available for those of you here using the app. For example, let me just click up here on a different region, see if it lists different things. Kyphosis is a condition in which there is abnormal curvature of the upper back. The thoracic spine has a normal curvature of 20 to 40 degrees. Any greater than this is considered to be thoracic kyphosis. Kyphosis may cause back pain, stiffness, neurologic deficit, or cardiopulmonary compromise. Let's see, there's another one. Scoliosis, I want you to know that one. Scoliosis is a back condition which causes the spine to curve to the left or right side. Thoracic scoliosis occurs in the middle part of the spine where a three-dimensional deformity of the vertebral column results in an abnormal curvature of the spine. <laughs> So it's a lateral curvature. So basically, if you look at the, like that view, it looks like it's kind of got a curvature that way. Okay, that right there is will be the abnormal curvature. Usually, um, they kind of check for this in gym class, um, junior high. That's kind of when they might present for the first time. Usually, they'll have you bend forward. And if you have a lateral curvature in your spine, one of your shoulder blades will stick up. So maybe it'll be like, kind of like that. And um, let me put that down. Continue here. One shoulder blade may protrude up. upwards when bending forward. Let's go one more condition up here on the uh, neck region. <coughs> Flash. Cervical whiplash. Whiplash is a term used to describe a neck injury that is usually caused by an abrupt, forceful motion of the cervical spine and the supporting muscles and soft tissues. Motor vehicle accidents are the most common cause of whiplash injury. Hyperflexion and hyperextension of the cervical vertebrae causes the spine to form an S-shaped curve. Symptoms of whiplash include neck pain or stiffness, headache, backache or pain, numbness or tingling in the shoulders or arms. When you study those uh, cervical bones in the lab, they're very small, so you kind of see why they're, they're prone to injury um, when you have that rapid flexion extension of the cervical region caused by a forceful, <coughs> rapid uh, flexion extension. of the cervical region. By the way, the three main ones are thoracic kyphosis, lordosis, and scoliosis. And those are the three. Uh, hunchback, swayback, um, and um, the lateral curvature of the spine. Okay. The swayback can be caused by um, anything that throws off your center of gravity in that region. Usually, um, if you have a lot of um, gain a lot of weight and you have a lot of abdo abdominal obesity, your center of gravity is in that region. It's about a, a little below and behind your belly button. And if you throw up your center of gravity, that, that makes you lean forward, say if you're pregnant, 
and you keep wanting to lean back, it kind of can cause this way back over time. So I want to move on. But whenever I, I present these, I always remember one of my first study groups when I took anatomy. It was the worst study group ever. It's like one guy, like he invited everyone in class to his place to study, and there's like 20 of us in his room, in his apartment, living room, and I was like, what am I doing here? I'm not doing anything. But one thing I do remember, um, this guy was like, hey, come on, show him that thing. And this guy, no, 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 come on, show him, show him, show him. And he goes, okay, yeah. Um, he goes, yeah, uh, is kyphosis, lordosis, scoliosis. <laughs> it's the only thing I learned from that study. I call it the uh, abnormal curvature dance now. Well, anyways, one of my fond memories of studying anatomy. Yeah, sure. Uh, could that also be caused by excessive anterior pelvic tilt? Yeah. Yeah, if you're tilting your pelvic too much, yeah, that's going to put it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, moving on. Um, you know, what, one of the things I expect students to know is I show you an individual vertebra, can you tell what region it's from? And so um, I usually go region by region from superior to inferior when we study all the attributes of it. So if we just look at the cervical vertebra, just kind of isolate them, C1 to C7. Um, what we usually say about this region is C3 to C6, we call them typical cervical vertebrae. They all look like each other. Okay. Cervical region. C3 through C6, they're typical. So let's look at one of them. <clears throat> now, before I kind of show you the cervical region, what I probably should do is, as I'm going through the parts, you should know the general parts that all the vertebra have, okay? So let's kind of table this for a second. We'll come back to it and talk about what's called the general, general characteristics of any vertebra. When you um, say vertebra and you want to pluralize it, you put an E on the end. If you drop the E, that refers to one vertebra. Now usually for this part of the lecture, um, books still go kind of like They'll, they'll pick one from the lumbar region, I don't know why, because they're big and they kind of look like all the rest, I guess. And if you isolate it, it kind of looks like that. And, but I like to use kind of the parts feature. And I like to, it makes it really easy for me to highlight things. If you look at a vertebra, they all kind of look like this. And the part that's in purple is called the vertebral body. That's one of the main parts that most vertebra have. One. Call that vertebral body. This is the weight bearing part. Okay, it's more massive in the lumbar region because they bear most of the body's weight. And this is the part that. It's filled with trabecular bone, and if you have osteoporosis later in life, the body may wedge, wedge in, and fracture. But anyways, vertebral body. Massive anterior part. And then, there's a hole that we already defined, the vertebral foramen. Right? I don't want to redefine it, but the bony arch that forms around it is called the vertebral arch. Sometimes called the neural arch, 
because let's remember that the spinal cord or spinal nerves will be found in there. The vertebral arch is composed of two pedicles, two lamina. Two pedicles, they kind of like attach anteriorly to the body. I'll just draw them as lines. Well, anyways, I'll put P and P for pedicle. And then to form the roof over the neural arch are the two lamina, L, L. Okay. And the space inside would be the vertebral foramen. That's basically what we mean by vertebral arch. So on the app, it allows me to highlight Okay, you tell me. On your half sheet, number two, identify what's highlighted in purple. On your half sheet, number two, identify. Let's call this 2A. That's 2A. For 2B, identify that. It's in purple. <clears throat> so what I really like about the app, I can highlight it and I can rotate it around in three-dimensional space. So going back for 2A, I highlight, highlighted this, but I could have also highlighted that. What did you call it? Pedicle. It's a pedicle, yeah. For 2B, I could have highlighted this one or that one. They're the same thing. What did you put? Lamina. Yeah, it's a lamina. Very good. So notice that coming off the neural arch, there are all these processes. In fact, there are seven of them. are seven processes. <laughs> Some of processes come off the neural arch or vertebral arch. Uh, well, basically, the one that comes off and goes straight posteriorly is the spinous process, one spinous process. So I'll highlight it in purple. Spinous process. It's posterior, so when you flex forward and you can feel all those bumps on the back of someone's backside, that's them. In the transverse plane, coming off to the sides, you have two transverse processes. Called so because they're in the transverse plane. So these um, are long extensions coming off the neural arch. So there's a lot of muscles and ligaments that attach there. That These act like levers for muscles and ligaments to attach to, to despite some stability. Here's a posterior view. So there's seven. How many have I named so far? Three. So there's four left. The remaining four processes are articular processes, two superior, two inferior. You can see them there. You have four 
peculiar processes. Two superior articular processes and facets I'll show you what I mean by process and facet. Well, let me show you now. A process is something that sticks out, sticks up. Okay. So in green here, this dark green I'll highlight in purple. That's the superior articular process, one of them. But do you see how there's like a white part on it, that flat part? That's the facet. A facet is pretty much where that will articulate with the vertebra above it. It'll, they'll meet on the facet. So basically, two superior articular processes, these processes will articulate with the vertebra above. Well then, the two inferior articular processes articulate with the vertebra below. Two inferior articular processes and facets articulate Now your notes are very straightforward and boring. If you ever have trouble sleeping at night, just read your notes. You fall right asleep. It's just very, uh, but you just have to get through it. You have to know the anatomy, okay? One thing about the facets for the inferior, well, here's an inferior articular process. We're looking at it posteriorly. So look up for a second. Do you see the facet from this perspective? The answer is no, you don't see it. You gotta go to the front side to see it. There it is, oh. So basically one difference is, the superior ones, their facets basically face backwards. But the inferior ones, their processes face forwards. Okay, so let me show you, show you the whole body. Let me do multi select here. Boom, boom, hide others, explode. So when I do explode, assemble, I mean, do you see how like they're all fitting together there? Yeah. So basically, do that in lab. Just kind of put them together. And seeing it is one thing, but doing it in lab, I don't really help you uh, kind of grasp that idea. Okay. So when I said with these facets, basically face backwards, face forwards. So um, basically, let's. Um, those are the general general characteristics you see in most vertebra. Let's go back to the uh, cervical region. Talk about the characteristics of cervical vertebra. There's a C. Let's do C. How about C four? I like C four. Isolate. <coughs> Here's a cervical vertebra. So let me give you the clues of how you can tell. I, I lay it out on the desk on a piece of carpet. Oh, by the way, um, see those carpet swatches way back there on the below the torsos? Proper way to use bones in the lab is the desks are very hard, and some of these um, fine processes are very fragile. So always use soft things to touch it. Put it on 
a soft carpet and uh, handled them with care. They're bones, they're dry bones, but they're human remains. So you have to be respectful how you treat them. But well, one clue, look at the spinous process. Um, it's like forked. C3, C6 are typical for the region. Note the fork or bifid. Spinous process. I don't, you don't see that in any other region. C3, C6, you, you see it. Look at the transverse process. It has a hole in it. And that hole highlighted in purple has a name. It's the transverse forming. So all right, another feature is the transverse processes have transverse forming. You don't see that in any other region. Whenever you have a hole, there's, there's a good reason for it. There's a nerve or blood vessel going through there. There's an artery called the vertebral artery for that reason. It actually ascends up the neck through those holes. Vertebral artery, little a is my abbreviation for artery, ascends up neck through these transverse forms. The A is for artery? Yes, that is correct. Let's go back to full body and show you that real quick. <coughs> Put on our arteries here. I'll highlight the, art, the vertebral artery. Here it is. See the artery highlighted, now isolated. So you see how the artery is ascending through those transverse foramen. So there is one artery you have to know in this class, or at least that one. That's an important one. There's only two arteries that enter the skull to supply blood to the brain, and that's one of them. So I think that's good for you to know now. Uh, because it ascends through the transverse form. Okay, well anyways, that's another clue. Uh, I think those are the two best clues to know you're looking at a cervical vertebrae. The other is size. So compare cervical, thoracic, lumbar. The cervical vertebrae are the smallest. I want to know that too. We have bone drawers here. Here's the lumbar one. There's the cervical. I know you really can't see this why we have lab, but we have them strung together, one from each region. So look how small that neck bone is. It's not very big. All right, so uh, I'm going to move on. Let's talk about C1, C2, C7. Those are the atypical ones.
meaning they don't look like C3 through C6. They kind of look like, well, for sure, you should be able to identify C1 and C2 by itself. Okay. If I say identify vertebra, you, you got to name it C1 or C2. I usually don't do that for C3, 4, 5, and 6. For example, let's say I had C4 and I say identify vertebra. It's hard to tell from 3 or 5 or 6. So I just say identify region. You should be able to tell that. But C1, C2, you should be able to tell. They're very distinctive and very important. Okay, let's do C1. Well, C1's at the top, right? So it articulates with your skull. There it is right there. It's C1. You know, if you isolate it, it's called atlas. as a name. Uh, for Greek mythology, atlas, he kind of had the world on his head. So this articulates with your head. So the name for C1 is atlas. And uh, know both. Know the name and know C1. Well, Atlas is very special because basically there's no body, right? There's no body. What I have highlighted in purple are the superior articular processes. And these are important for me. This is how I tell the top to the bottom of this bone. If I, if I see those big superior articular processes, and I compare them with the ones on the other side. See those inferior ones? They're kind of smaller and shaped differently. I know that's the superior aspect of the bone. Okay. So that's another feature. The superior articular processes, um, the facets are actually very large because they articulate with their skull. Superior articular facets articulate with the occipital condyles of the occipital bone. occipital bone is the base of your skull. Let's go back and look at C1 in the body. I have C1 highlighted. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fade others. Here's an anterior view. Can you see that C1 is behind your upper jaw? It's, it's way up there. That's where it is, okay? Posterior to upper jaw, behind upper jaw. Can we do a multi select? I'm going to highlight the occipital bone right there, and I'm going to isolate them. Um, I'm going to hide others and then explode. So the top bone, see if you're with me, is what bone again? What's the top bone? <clears throat> Occipital bone. See how it's shaped like a cockle shell? You can find it on the beach or something. That's the base of your skull. It's the base and the bottom of your skull. And it's articulating with C1. There's the superior articular processes. And those are the occipital condyles. Do you see how the occipital condyles are going to fit in the superior articular processes when you assemble, explode, assemble, looking like this? So that joint is a very important joint. It's called the atlano-occipital joint, the joint between your occipital bone and atlas. So, um, 
So I'll just say forms. You know, I'm going to continue up here. You can see better. Forms. Atlanta occipital joint. This is a joint that allows movement of the head. We call it yes movement. Well, basically, that's yes movement, like when you say yes to someone. Well, anyways, movement at that joint is that movement. Okay, that's kind of what we said. It's flexing the head forward, basically. <coughs> you know, I think it's a good time for a break. Uh, come back at 9 o'clock.